All right, the next thing we want to talk about is merchandising activities. Um, what you have to do is realize that not all businesses do the same thing. And so usually businesses are categorized um, based upon their activities. And so um, one type of activity is called merchandising activity. And a merchandiser is someone who doesn't purchase or doesn't make the things that they sell. They simply purchase them from the manufacturer and turn around and try to sell those for a profit. Um, distinguish that from the manufacturer. That's manufacturing activities. And then there's another type of activity that's pretty prevalent these days called um, service activity. Service companies are big in this economy. So um, usually it's broken up into those three categories, although I guess for IT companies you can make a separate category, but quite frankly it's they're a service industry. All right, so here we're looking at merchandising activities. Um, <clears throat> typically, mer merchandising activities have uh, an operating cycle of sorts. Um, I mean, this is this operating cycle is kind of ever continuous, but uh, it starts with purchases of merchandise with cash which you turn that merchandise into your inventory uh, it becomes your inventory and uh, the reason it's your inventory is because you're not looking to keep it you're not looking to utilize it in your business necessarily you're looking to sell it to someone else for a profit Compare that with office equipment, furn uh, office furniture, and stuff like that. Well, that's not, unless you're in the furniture business, that's not inventory. That is uh, part of your property and equipment that you utilize in the business. So you're, you're purchasing this merchandise with the objective of selling it in the future for a profit. Um, let's say you do sell that merchandise on credit that uh, turns into an accounts receivable and you will collect the money from your customers sometime in the future. And when you do collect that receivable, it turns back into cash, which you use to purchase uh, more merchandise. Of course, you also use that for salaries, rent, and other expenses. So it's just kind of a never, ever, well, let's put it this way, an ever continuous cycle. <clears throat> and remember, uh, merchandising activities are different from uh, manufacturing activities. Uh, merchandising activities are, are are have as as its base inventory that has been purchased been per, uh, purchased from a manufacturer who has actually made the product uh, whereas manufacturing uh, activities involve different types of or different kinds of inventory normally they're the inventory that they have is raw materials inventory that they turn into a product. Note that manufacturing uh, activities may have a longer and more complex operating cycle. Understand that as far as merchandising activities are concerned, there are different types of merchandisers uh, and retailers and wholesalers are what they're called. 
wholesalers buy merchandise from several different manufacturers and then sell that merchandise to several retailers uh, retailers sell directly to the public but uh, the bottom line is both uh, wholesalers and retailers are considered merchandising firms now what dis distinguishes merchandising companies from service companies is that they have this thing called cost of goods sold they purchase the goods for sale when they sell the goods they are able to keep track of the cost of those items sold and so merchandising companies have as one of well they have a couple of different components different from service companies in their income statement they have an account called cost of goods sold which keeps track of those merchandise items that they have sold they're matched with the revenues that they relate to and the difference between the revenue from sales and cost of goods sold is called gross profit the rest of it's the same less expenses equals net income gross profit um, again third-party users of financial statements like to see that number especially as it relates to a percentage not necessarily the dollar amount and it's a means of measuring the profitability of sales transactions the higher the gross profit percentage the the better. Now we talked a little bit about this and that we have ledger accounts but ledger accounts don't give us a whole lot of information or at least not the kind of information that we would need certain ledger accounts don't and so for like accounts receivable and accounts payable we need details of who owes us money if it's accounts receivable or who we owe money to if it's accounts payable and so we have what are called subsidiary ledgers which list the in this case in this example the customers who owe us money how much they owe and we keep track of our sales to these customers and when they pay us again uh, most companies especially like a wholesaler uh, merchandising company would be dealing with a retailer on credit terms so this would be that kind of situation where you're paying on credit or you're you're selling on credit to a customer and so you need to keep track of what they owe you and of course what they what they pay and so we call the general ledger accounts receivable account the overall control account which lists the balances of all subsidiary ledger accounts receivable accounts and so in this example notice that we have two sales on June 1 one for 3,000 one for 7,000 that totals 10,000 in our control account and notice on June 15 we credit both accounts one for 1000 the other for 2000 that shows up in our general ledger accounts receivable control account as the total the sum of those 3000 and the balance 
in the control account is the balance of those two subsidiary ledger accounts. So your control account should match up with your subsidiary ledger accounts for that particular account, in this case accounts receivable at, at any point in time. Now, how companies keep track of their inventory um, is also uh, an issue. They can do it one of two ways, depending on the size of the company, the, there's all kinds of different um, factors to consider. The larger you are, the more likely you are to use what's called a perpetual inventory system. What, what you're doing with a perpetual inventory system is you're tracking uh, your inventory, specific inventory, in and out as it's bought and sold. Um, now, the other type of inventory system that we'll look at here is called a periodic inventory system. There, you're not keeping track of, uh, well, you're keeping track of purchases of inventory, but you're not, as you're selling the inventory, you're not keeping track of it. You just do that like once a year or every six months or so. So we'll look at both uh, systems. More and more companies are going to the perpetual inventory system because it's gotten cheaper to track. And so even small to medium sized companies can use a perpetual inventory system. So this is probably the the more important of the two that you need to learn but I guess you need to learn both for this class. Alright so let me give you an example of a perpetual inventory system. Here we uh, in this example we purchased 10 uh, computer monitors on account from Okawa wholesale company. The monitors cost 600 each for a total of $6,000 owed. Payment is due in 30 days. And so we're going to debit in our general journal, inventory account, credit, accounts payable. It will go in our accounts payable control account for accounts payable. That's the overall accounts payable account and then you'll have a subsidiary ledger account called under accounts payable called Okawa Wholesale Company and record that for six thousand. Hmm. That's weird. Trying to figure out what this is. Okay, so this is a computer city who's who bought that. Didn't didn't make that real clear. Um, and so that's the inventory we're talking about. Is these six monitors. And so on September 7th, Computer City, who bought the six monitors at $100 each, 6,000 total, sells two computer monitors for a thousand per unit on account to RJ Travel Agency. Well, if they sell two, they bought them for 600 and they're selling them for a thousand, they're getting 
$400 profit, right, on each one. So they, they book that as accounts receivable. Again, the subsidiary ledger account would be RJ Travel Agency, 2000. Sales or sales revenue, if you wish, 2000. Because they are on perpetual inventory system, they know which items they've sold. They're tracking these, so they know that those items cost 600 apiece, so they uh, create an account called cost of goods sold, first of all, which is a um, an expense account, so it's another expense account. And debit it for twelve hundred. And of course they have to take it take those two monitors that cost six hundred each out of inventory. So look what's happened is they've got gross profit of how much? $800 off this sale. So uh, they're keeping cr track of this perpetually. Now on October 1, Computer City paid Okawa Wholesale for the September 1 purchase. So they would um, debit the accounts payable, closing out the amount they owe to Okawa Wholesale. And of course, their credit would be to cash, reducing cash by 6000 On October 7, Computer City collected the 2,000 accounts receivable from RJ Travel Agency for their purchase on September 7th. So they would simply debit, cash, and uh, close out that account. Well, not close it out, but uh, reduce it, the accounts receivable account, the sub-ledger account being RJ Travel Agency. Okay, so that's basically how a uh, perpetual inventory system would work. And we're looking at... Um, well, never mind. All right. One thing about a perpetual inventory system is, um, you know, you think by doing it that way, you're always going to know what you have in inventory. But because of theft, because of well, you know, certain types of inventory might uh, perish, you know, if it's like bananas or tomatoes or, you know, you name it. If you're in the grocery business, you might have perishable items that, you know, turn into pia and they're no longer any good. So, um, and then, you know, there might be some obsolescence. You might have some inventory that just is too, too old, too out of date to use. So even if you use a perpetual inventory system, it is a smart idea to take a physical inventory at least once a year. And so this is meant to ensure the accuracy of your perpetual records uh, and as I pointed out, most businesses take a complete physical count of the merchandise on hand at least once a year. I worked in a uh, oil supply business owned by uh, the parent company I worked for. And 
I remember doing a physical uh, inventory and it requires a lot of detail. Uh, you have to go physically, in this case, go count the pieces of pipe you have, the valves you have, the fittings you have. I mean, it's just minute detail that's just mind-numbing. But that's what you have to do. Now, what happens if your physical inventory account and your perpetual inventory records don't match? Well, what usually is going to happen is that your physical inventory number is going to be less than your perpetual number. And so that's called inventory shrinkage and reasonable amounts of inventory shrinkage are viewed as a normal cost of doing business. Um, you know, if you've got a, a large variation, you might consider the fact that uh, employee theft is going on. Uh, I may have mentioned this before. If not, one of the major sources of losses in a company are due to employee theft. And, you know, while cash is king when it comes to th theft by employees, certainly taking inventory and converting it into cash would be um, the second best option. So um, you might need to make sure you have proper internal controls at the, at, if you have a large inventory shrinkage amount. And so in this example, uh, Computer City takes a physical inventory at the end of the year and they, they find that uh, physical inventory amount is $2,200 less than the perpetual records show. And so what they simply do is record it as a cost of goods sold. And so they debit cost of goods sold so that's an expense, right? And that for $2,200, and they decrease inventory by crediting, crediting it for $2,200. Um, recall our closing entries after we prepare our financial statements. Just know that closing entries in a perpetual inventory system are basically the same when you close the revenue accounts to income summary, you include the sales as a revenue. And then when you close expense accounts, you include cost of goods sold because it is an expense to income summary. And then of course you would do steps three and four like you would normally do. Now, for a periodic inventory system, you would not keep track of your inventory as you purchased it. And so here we have an example on January 6, Wagner Office Supplies purchased merchandise amounting to $2,000 on account from Inkjet Solutions. So what they do instead of booking this to inventory they book it to an account called purchases and so this holds all of the purchases made by this company during the year and what they will do here under the periodic inventory system at the end of the year they will do a physical count of their inventory and of course they know what beginning inventory is for the period because that was the same number as ending period, the ending inventory for the prior period. And so all they do is when they try to figure out cost of goods sold is they 
They take their beginning inventory for the year. They add to it the purchases. Those two amounts equal the sum of the cost of goods that are available for sale. And then the, they do their physical inventory at the end of the year. That's their ending inventory. And so the difference between the cost of goods available for sale and the amount of inventory at hand at the end of the year is called their cost of goods sold. So anyway, we'll see that here in a second. So anyway, bottom line is we don't make an entry to, the, to an inventory account. We wait to the end of the year to, to worry about cost of goods sold. All right, so we, we debit purchases for this amount. And so what happens is they, during the year, they purchase a total of 130,000. Every time they purchase something, the debit is to purchases. So you've got this purchase account that builds up during the year they, again, they know what their beginning inventory was on January 1 because that's the same number as ending inventory on December 31 of the prior year, right? They, they do their physical inventory on December 31st and find out that they only have $12,000 worth of supplies on hand. So what they do is they can take those numbers and calculate cost of goods sold. So beginning inventory, 14,000. They add their purchases during the year of 130,000, which equals cost of goods available for sale. They take their ending inventory and subtract that from CGAS, as I call it, to come up with cost of goods sold. And here's the entry that they make. They create an account called cost of goods sold. They, since it's a, an expense, remember, they debit cost of goods sold for the 144000 They back out the beginning inventory for the year, 14000 and they back out the purchases. Remember, all those purchases would have been debit balances at the end of, uh, of the year. That's the total amount of purchases that were made during the year. And then the next thing they do is they just simply record their ending inventory. Um, so they debit inventory end of year. Notice these are all happening at the end of the year. These are end of year adjustments. And then um, they debit or excuse me, credit cost of goods sold. Why are they crediting cost of goods sold? Well, the amount of cost of goods sold for the year was the difference between 144 and 12, right? Or 132. Let's, let's go back and look at that. No, I'm sorry. That's the uh, the 132 is yeah the cost of goods sold. And so that's this explains that you're backing out your beginning inventory. You're closing your purchasing account to zero, transferring all that to cost of goods sold. And 
you're transferring 